Hi, everybody. Welcome tonight. Thank you for joining us. Uh, before we get started on this live workshop, I want to mention in honor of World Mental Health Day next week on October 10th, this entire month, we are offering four of our workshops that are usually members only for free for anybody that would like to try us out. You can head to medcircle.com to check out one of those four workshops, or they are listed below. I'll go into a little more detail about each one that we're offering throughout the workshop tonight, uh, but we are very excited to be doing so. Tonight, we have four different doctors on with us. Uh, the first half of this workshop will be with Dr. Tuslam and Dr. Judy Ho. We're going to go through two techniques. Each doctor is going to present one for us. We're going to discuss a little bit about what is low-grade depression versus severe depression and how this affects our productivity, whether that's at work or our everyday life. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Tuslam first on... Hi, Dr. Tuslam. How hey, are you? Good. How are you? Good. Uh, can you explain a little bit about what low-grade depression is and um, possibly what how it counteracts with severe depression? Sure. So when we're talking about low-grade depression, we're really talking about those symptoms that are starting to show up. So we may notice things like low mood, low energy, um, less interest in the things that we used to do um, or the things that used to bring us enjoyment. We may notice that we just don't want to do the things that we typically have enough energy to do and the things that bring us satisfaction. We may want to stay in bed more. Um, so it's, it's those typical symptoms of depression, but they're not necessarily getting in the way of our daily lives, but they're definitely getting in the way of our satisfaction in our daily lives. Whereas when we think about a severe episode of depression, we often see that folks really are struggling to get their daily activities done. Um, there's very little or no pleasure or enjoyment in anything that a person is doing. There's very little motivation to do things. And so we see that a person's um, ability to actually engage in their lives is severely compromised in a very different way that, than what we would see with low-grade depression, um, where a person is typically able to do most of the things, they're probably not doing those extra things anymore, um, but they're typically able to do whatever they have to get done. Thank you for kind of delineating between the two. Um, I myself have had, you know, bouts of depression. Uh, sometimes it was low grade. It was just kind of like this feeling of stagnation or, uh, you know, really couldn't focus on things, just kind of had this really indifferent kind of feeling towards life. And other times it was definitely more of a severe depression after a significant event like my divorce or, um, you know, a chronic illness diagnosis, something like that. So uh, thank you. And I believe uh, we have Dr. Judy as well. Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, there she is. Hi, Dr. Judy. How are you? Hi, guys. Nice to be here. And thank you so much for putting this together. I really hope that our viewers are going to enjoy what we're going to be doing because I think it's going to be so helpful. Absolutely. Um, we are so excited to dig into both of your exercises. Uh, first, though, Dr. Judy, do you want to speak just a little bit about depression, like any advice you can give uh, or, or something that's very important for us to know before we start these exercises? Well, I think what's important to know is that oftentimes when people experience depression, they're still beating themselves up, which of course makes the depression worse. And I just want to really normalize this feeling of depression, um, whether or not you have brief depression after situations that are stressful, or you have a clinical depression where it persists more and you might need treatment. It is a normative process and normative emotional experience for many people. And so I think it's important for all of us to recognize that whether or not you feel like you're suffering from depression yourself, or you have a loved one who is suffering from depression, that it's something that is quite normal. It is something that um, is treatable, as we're going to demonstrate, always there's ways to help yourself. But understanding that when you're in that depressed state, it can really feel hopeless and futile at times. And it can take you away from trying to uh, solve the problem and trying to feel better on a day to day basis. And obviously, sometimes that treatment uh, process is going to be a bit of a journey. But if you can every single day do something to improve your mental wellness, I think that that's going to be a really, really important aspect of hoping um, to feel better over the long run and also to develop resilience um, the next time you find that depression is setting in again. Thank you, Dr. Judy. Um, as you both know, we've kind of already discussed, we're going to do two different exercises. First, Dr. Teslam is going to take 
Dr. Judy and myself through an exercise. We're both going to participate, and I really highly encourage you to do so as well. Uh, feel free to drop in the chat, whether you're on our member platform or on YouTube, as you're going through this, what you're experiencing, what you're thinking. Uh, it's it's kind of nice to take this journey together. So I will leave um, that now to Dr. Tussle. Yeah, thanks, Mandy. So um what we're going to talk about today is a dialectical behavior therapy strategy called ABC, please. Um, and it might seem pretty basic, pretty logical, but uh, one of the things that happens when we start to experience symptoms of depression is that we start to not do the things that help keep us well. Um, part of that is related to decreases in motivation and energy. Part of it is also related to not really feeling that joy and that satisfaction that we usually feel when we do things. And so part of what happens is we do less. And then because we're doing less, we have fewer opportunities to have joy and have excitement and have happiness. Uh, and so we kind of feel worse. And then as a response, we're feeling worse. So we're doing less and we're feeling less good. And then we're doing less and we're feeling less good. And that's often what can contribute to, for example, a low grade depression kind of deteriorating, worsening um, into um, a full blown episode of major depressive disorder. And so what, what ABC please teaches us is that the first, so it's an acronym, DBT full of acronyms. Um, so let's talk about the ABC part first. So the A part is accumulating positive experiences. So as Dr. Judy mentioned, one of the things that we can do to help keep ourselves well when starting to experience some of those um, first symptoms of a depressive episode is to do fun, exciting, um, pleasurable things. And so when we can think about all of the things that we could possibly enjoy in our lives, start choosing things and planning them into your day. They don't need to be productive. Um, even if you haven't done the dishes and you haven't done the laundry and you haven't responded to all those emails, don't worry about those right now. Just do the things that are going to bring you any type of happiness, joy, excitement, any type of positive emotion. So that's the A. Um, the next is to build mastery. And this is something that we've talked about at Med Circle before, but building mastery is really about feeling a sense of accomplishment and a sense of purpose. So often when we're younger, uh, we have experiences of building mastery all the time, right? The first time you take your steps, the first time you are able to solve that puzzle. Uh, but as we get older, many of us are on autopilot. We're not necessarily building towards new experiences. Um, we're kind of just doing the things that need to get done. And so building mastery is about intentionally working towards things, whether that is um, you know, trying a new recipe out or working out and noticing that you're running faster or you're lifting heavier weights. Um, I know for me, I, I feel a sense of mastery when um, I, I really like music and I really like singing music. I pretend I'm a pop star sometimes. And so when I listen to a song that I haven't heard in years and I can remember the lyrics, that brings me a sense of accomplishment and mastery. So that's something that I like to do. And then the last part is coping ahead. Um, so that's the C of ABC. And so when we're coping ahead, what we're trying to do is think about any types of stressful situations or problems that may come up in the like, immediate-ish future. So this is not about like worrying about the future, but rather, hey, I have this family gathering or hey, I have this job interview. How do I cope ahead? What do I need to do to take care of myself? How do I minimize the problems? That might be practical things like what time do I need to leave home and can I pick out my clothes ahead of time? Or it might be emotional things like can I practice some grounding while this stressful thing is happening? Can I make sure that I have a support person around me? So let's start with that ABC and um, I'll ask uh, Mandy and Dr. Judy to come back and we can kind of chat about it. All right. Um, I really like that. It seems like a pretty easy uh, system to follow and remember, thanks to the acronym. Uh, Dr. Judy, I know you know DBT very well as well. Do you have any thoughts on this? Well, I love this technique because I think it breaks things down pretty uh, pretty simply, and it's important for when pe for when people are especially suffering from depression because everything can feel super overwhelming. 
So going back to the ABCs is a great technique. I'm so glad that you shared this. And doing pleasant things. I was so funny, as you were speaking, Dr. Kathleen, I was thinking about a lot of the things that I find um, to be pleasant activities as well. And we share some of those things, like our investment and interest in music. And I love playing music. I love singing. I love uh, playing my instruments. Uh, and it's so helpful that we can learn that sometimes even just five minutes, like what you were saying about, you know, singing as a pop star in the shower, you know, that's only five, 10 minutes, but it just makes you feel so much better. And music can really change the emotional expression that's going on currently. It can really tap into your emotional state and actually help you to express emotions better too, which is such an important part of um, the therapeutic process in self-development is that we understand how to identify our own emotions. Because sometimes that frustration comes when we feel like, ah, we're just not happy, but we don't know what it is, you know, but um, using music as a channel to express your emotions better. I love that. Yeah, I think it's funny that you both brought up music because <laughs> that that would be in my B's, my build mastery. I am not good at music at all. It's a matter of fact, one of the one of the very few things that I'm very challenged at. And um, I started taking lessons about a year ago to try and get better. And um, I would I hate to say that the progress is much slower than I'd like. But but what's fun is the warm up exercises. Uh, they, they can be silly, like make siren noises and, and do these really different things. And that does lighten the mood. It kind of takes you out of that funk a little bit or the monotony of the day to day. So that was kind of cool. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for the, bringing that up, Mandy. I think one of the things when we're thinking about building mastery is also to choose the things that are achievable. Um, and so if you're about to start a music class, but you know that that's hard for you, um, especially when you're starting to experience those symptoms of depression, you're probably going to be harder on yourself. You're probably going to have so much more negative self-talk and you're more likely to give, give up easily or at least not see the progress that you're making. Um, and so depending on your mindset, it might be a great time to start a music class. It might not also be the best time to start a music class. Um, so it really just depends on uh, how dedicated you are and how much of a challenge you're ready for. I'm glad that you brought that up because I think readiness, I think there's that fine line about, you know, pushing yourself a little bit, maybe when you're not ready, but then also honoring what your needs really are and not pushing it too much. So you get overwhelmed. Uh, and if either of you have insight on how to walk that line a little bit better, <laughs> that would be very helpful as well. Yeah. So, I mean, one of the things that I often encourage folks to do is, is to just be experimental and curious about it. Um, and so if it's something that you've wanted to do, try it, but be gentle, right? And recognize that if it's not working or if you're getting too frustrated, it's not the right time to do it. Um, and I mean, just before this, we were talking about how we all have kids. And one of the things that we teach our kids, right, is that um, you want to kind of get at activities right below that super frustrated moment. And that's when the optimal learning can happen. And that's the same thing for us. If we get too frustrated, we're going to give up. We're going to think that we can't do it. And so finding things that are challenging enough that we feel that sense of competence, we feel confident in ourselves. We feel like we're accomplishing something without finding the things that um, we are overly frustrated about. And it's not actually about the task itself. It's about our mindset, right? And so that's speaking to the readiness, but that's also speaking to just where we're at with our emotional health, because sometimes we can do that really hard puzzle or we can figure out that really challenging problem. And sometimes we just don't have it in us or we're too frustrated. And that's a good time to kind of check in with ourselves, um, see how we're feeling, see what's actually getting in the way of us being able to solve that problem. And sometimes reaching out for help, whether that's professional help or, you know, just calling a friend uh, to help you figure things out and solve the problem with you. Excellent. Uh I have a question just about maybe how to do this. Um, as far as like accumulating those positive experiences, do you recommend we write them down, do a vision board, a uh, journal? Could it be anything just as long as it's accumulating those experiences? Yeah, it's a great question, Mandy. So what I usually do with clients is I'll actually provide them with a list of pleasurable activities. So on that list could be like, like I think there's like, 300 things on that list. Some of them sound awful, like 
I am not a camper, but some people love camping. So um, some things are going to work for us. Some things are not going to work for us. So usually once I provide that list for clients, what I'll encourage them to do is to go through it first and just get rid of the things you know are not actually fun for you, right? Because then you're bringing it down. It feels way less overwhelming and it feels like a list that's for you. Then I'll have them go through it a second time um, and then kind of identify the things that you could do like right now or this evening versus the things that take a bit more planning. Um, and so then you have a bit more of a tailored list and you can start thinking about future oriented things, which is really helpful for when we're experiencing depressive um, symptoms. But then we can also think about the things that don't require a whole lot of planning. Then absolutely plan them and schedule them in. So one of the things that I'm sure we have all experienced is the idea that I'm going to read or I'm going to, you know, do some more coloring. And then all of a sudden the evening is over and you didn't do the thing you wanted to do. But if you decide when you're going to do it, what do you need to do it? How are you going to do it? This allows us to be a bit more committed to actually getting it done. Um, and especially when we're experiencing those symptoms of depression uh, that follow through becomes so much more challenging. So the prompts, the reminders, um, kind of like thinking about it like a little cheerleader that's encouraging you to get the thing done that will hopefully be enjoyable, but at worst be kind of neutral um, can be really, really helpful. But on top of that, for those who like to do vision boards, who like to find um, visual ways of representing those fun ideas, absolutely create that vision board, journal the ideas that you think you're going to have. They don't need to come from a generic list. They can come from within you. Uh, but if you're feeling a little bit stuck, the, the list can be pretty helpful. I like that because uh, oftentimes just words or or visuals alone can really evoke some positive emotion and get you out of that hopeless state just, just by seeing it or hearing it. Uh, so I really like that we're kind of accumulating the good. You spoke a little bit about the B, the building mastery. Is there anything else you'd like to layer on to that? Yeah. So I think just what we talked about before around uh, making sure that it's especially when the goal is building mastery, that whatever we're trying to do feels manageable so that it's not too overwhelming. I think about that be like, we can call it building mastery, but I think about it as like, what are the things that make me feel like a boss? Um, and so <laughs> I do my boss things when I'm trying to build mastery, because then I can kind of feel a little good, feel a little tougher, feel a little stronger and more capable. Um, yeah. So that's what I would say about that. Uh, I like the C as far as cope ahead. Um, because I think anytime I think of coping, it's like in the moment. Um, so, so what are some examples of, of coping ahead that let's say I'm very overwhelmed, you know, mom, three kids, full-time job, uh, chronic illness, there's a lot on the plate to manage. Uh, and I, you know, could get stressed and kind of, you know, a little depressed sometimes that maybe I'm not enough or I don't have enough to go around to, you know, give my best to everybody, including myself, uh, wh what would cope ahead look like in that situation? Yeah, thanks for that, Mandy. So I think for me, when I think about cope ahead, it's really about reflecting on what are some of the things that um, are particularly stressful that are coming up. So I mean, there's the everyday stress. And I think some of that can be managed through the pleas that we're going to talk about shortly. But let's say it's a day where like, you have all of the parent teacher interviews and all of the extracurricular activities. And, you know, you have to have a really hard conversation with a parent or a sibling. Um, and so on those days, you know that your stress levels are going to be heightened. You know that things might feel a little bit more challenging. So those are days where you would maybe want to think about coping ahead. Um, and then what that looks like is so person dependent. But some of the things we can think about are like all of the planning that you can do reasonably do that, right? So whether that's looking at your calendar and kind of rejigging things to make it work, whether that's making sure that you're um, planning out your meals on a day like that, whether that's reaching out to the people who have your back and make you feel valued and loved and letting them know what's going on so that if you need them to step in or to help or just to be there, um, that they're ready to do that and you know that they're going to pick up the phone. So coping ahead can be all sorts of things, but it's really about thinking about those stressful situations, recognizing that they are likely to be stressful, not too stressful, but a little bit stressful, and then doing the things you need to do for yourself as well as to help you be successful in that thing. 
I like that. I like that thinking ahead before it's maybe even a problem before we're actually in that moment and we don't know how to cope. Uh, that, that works really well. If you're finding this beneficial or you are kind of intrigued at how this is running, the, I mean, these are actionable things that you can do in your day-to-day -day life. You don't have to wait to get a therapy appointment. You don't have to read through a long book. Uh, and we, we do that intentionally so that you can start to make moves in your life that, that you're desiring. Uh, so if you feel this is useful, please share it out on social, send the link to your friend. I'll text my mom to, <laughs> to get on if she's not already on. I hope she's on. Thanks, mom. Uh, so thank you very much, Dr. Tuslim, for sharing that exercise. Are there um, any final thoughts before we go into our first member question? Yeah. So there's the second part of that, which is the please, the please. Again, <laughs> is totally fine uh, and, and pretty simple. So the please stands for uh, treating physical illness, uh, balanced eating, avoiding mood altering drugs or substances, getting good sleep and having a balanced diet. So these are really basic self-care things, but things that kind of fall to the wayside, especially when things get hard. So the more we can focus on taking care of ourselves, um, especially when we're physically ill, making sure we're taking the medication that's been prescribed to us and avoiding any medication or drugs that haven't been prescribed to us if they're not helpful to us, um, making sure that we're getting adequate sleep, which of course can be hard, especially when we're struggling with our mental health, um, getting enough exercise and physical activity, um, and then as, as balanced of a diet as we can have and eating the portions that feel good for our bodies and that are respectful of our bodies and energy levels. I, I know for myself personally, and I'm not sure if Dr. Judy can speak to this as well, but uh, self-care kind of just get, unfortunately goes on the back burner sometimes, but it's so important to put that first, um, you know, to make sure you're getting enough sleep if you can. I mean, I know at times when you're depressed, you might be getting too much or too little, but any little movements that you can make uh, can really make a big difference. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think that oftentimes self-care, like you said, does go to the wayside. We think, okay, that's the thing that can go in all of the things that are on my to-do list, but really it should always be at the top of your to-do list. I know that's harder said than done, but I also want to encourage people to think about self-care as something that can be done in less than five minutes. You know, it can just be lighting a candle and really savoring that moment, having coffee mindfully and not doing your to-do list at the same time or having a work conversation. And the most important thing is that it's intentional, that this is my moment for self-care, whether it's three minutes or 30 minutes, make sure you make time for it and that it, maybe it's the first thing that you have to do. Maybe it should be part of your morning routine so you make sure that it always gets done. Uh, Dr. Judy, I believe on your last workshop that you hosted, you actually walked, that was one of the exercises you walked us through the different areas of self-care and how to schedule it in. Uh, it, was, it was amazing. It was very, very insightful. So, so thank you for that. Um, all right. I think we'll head to our first member question. During depressive episodes, doing pleasant things is so challenging because I no longer feel joy. Do you recommend doing things you remember brought you happiness? Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, absolutely. You know, I think some sometimes we are uh, afraid or nervous that we're not going to feel the same level of joy that we did prior to our depressive symptoms. And so we don't want to because there's a risk there. Um, and yet it's doing those things that can help bring any amount of positive experience. And the more we invite those positive experiences, the more likely we are to experience more of those positive experiences. So kind of the way I had described the like, we don't do things, our depression gets worse. We don't do things more, our depression gets worse. It works in that opposite way as well. So the, the few positive experiences that you can have allow for more positive experiences, which allow for more positive experiences. Um, and so yes, start with the things that you know used to bring you joy because that's a reliable way to start and worst case scenario you have a neutral experience best case scenario there's a little bit of enjoyment there um, and you may want to consistently do it some more Awesome. We talked a, a little bit uh, just in reference to the last exercise about emotions and feelings. And we do have one of the four workshops that are offered um, on medcircle.com, right on the homepage that you can try for free till the end of the month, um, is on emotional intelligence. So I think a lot of us can, you know, have mental intelligence. We think, you know, we know this, we know that. We know we have emotions. We may be very in tune with our emotions, but 
um, th there's always growth that can be done in those and it can just bring awareness to what you're feeling in certain moments and, and even how to adjust that. And if you are a parent or have a friend or anything, it just helps really bring more, um, more understanding to what those emotions are and how they can affect our life. So uh, I, I encourage you to check it out. Uh, Dr. Judy, are you ready to move on to your exercise? Absolutely. Very, very excited to introduce this exercise. And this exercise, actually, I think dovetails very nicely with the exercise that we just did with Dr. Toslin, because it's all about designing a beautiful day. Yeah. So when people are feeling down, and especially when you're struggling with anhedonia, and just like this member's question, where sometimes you don't even remember the things that brought you joy, and you have to really try to recollect that from your past, whatever it is that you're struggling with, this is going to be a very helpful exercise for you. And I love this exercise, because it really helps you to go from, you know, feeling so so about your mental health to getting to a place of flourishing. So I'm going to ask our wonderful tech team to bring up the first image that I've prepared, which is all about this interesting uh, bell shaped curve about our mental state and how we're feeling. And so, you know, when you are struggling, you may feel like I'm being bogged down by my symptoms. I'm in the throes of my illness at this point. And then when you're feeling better, maybe you're in a place of moderate mental health. You know, you feel pretty good, but whenever stress comes your way, it can be really difficult to get back on your feet or you find yourself knocked down for a whole weekend and you wonder why that happened. So the key is to try to get yourself to a place of flourishing. And flourishing has a lot of different definitions when it comes to mental health. And the idea is that you are in a state where you're experiencing positive emotions on a regular basis. It just does not mean that you should be always happy because nobody is, but that you're creating those experiences, like Dr. Toslin said, about having those positive experiences, just giving yourself the opportunity to have them. And positive psychological functioning, helpful social functioning most of the time, right? So nobody can do this all of the time. But the aim is that when you are flourishing, you're able to connect with people in a meaningful way, experience positive emotions on a regular basis, and achieve good functioning in major areas of your life most of the time. And we would call this as living within an optimal range of human functioning. And so it's all about this uh, inherent idea of feeling good and functioning well, and feeling like even if stressful situations are going to come your way, you're going to have the ability to handle it because all of us are going to deal with stressful emotions. It's really about your belief, your self-efficacy on whether or not you can manage what's ahead of you. So one practice that I really like doing is the beautiful day exercise. And my version of this exercise involves five stages. So the first stage is to really think a little bit about what you used to like to do or what you enjoy doing now and really thinking through and brainstorming what a beautiful day might look like for you. So this first step is called reflect and brainstorm. You're going to spend some time thinking about the different experiences that you had in the past that brought you joy and brought you happiness. And it's really thinking back to any forgotten details, maybe things that you used to enjoy before you started feeling depressed and remembering how much you enjoyed those things. Obviously, when you're thinking about planning one beautiful day, you can't do all of those things. But in this first stage, we're just going to brainstorm all of the different types of scenarios and activities that brought you joy. So again, to dovetail on what Dr. Tazlam just shared about building that list of things that bring you joy, you can bring that into this exercise. You can think about the activities that bring you happiness and make sure that you write it down during this brainstorming phase. So we don't have to necessarily organize them into your beautiful day now, but I would just really challenge everybody who is watching this right now to come up with at least five to 10 activities or experiences that used to bring you joy in the past 
or you believe can bring you joy now. And they can range anything from things that you can do in under a minute to things that are a bit more involved, like going out for a nice sit down meal to something like dancing to your favorite song. It can be anything that is very, very short in duration to anything that might take a little bit longer to savor. So I would just love to see what um, the two of you have written down and some of the things that you're thinking about. I mean, I think I know a couple of the things that are gonna be on Dr. Toslin's list, which is gonna involve music, but I wanna <laughs> know what those specific things are. And then Mandy, I haven't checked in with you for a while about what your favorite activities and hobbies are lately. So anyway, I'd love to hear what you guys have put on your list. Dr. Tesla, go first. Yeah, sure. I don't know that I have five to 10, but I'm, I'm going to roll with it and we'll see where it leads us. <laughs> um, so definitely I would say dancing. Um, I used to be a dance performer. I haven't done that in a long time. And so I'm um, definitely remembering those moments where I was on stage, totally free, to, like feeling um, confident and just letting my body move to the music in a really liberating way. So that would be one of the things. Um, I also really, really like to bake. Um, and so coming up with creative ideas of what I want a cake to be like, um, and then to decorate it and to just have time to spend in that process feels really good to me. Um, I also like the beach. And so uh, feeling the sun on my skin, hearing the water, um, and just kind of being at peace for a little while. I love my sister and I love spending time with my sister. I love hearing my son's laugh um, and I love hugs from my husband. Oh my God, you came Aww. up with seven. Yeah. So that was <laughs> awesome. And I feel like Dr. Tazen, we're like long lost friends because I used to also be a dance performer. Nice. I also love the beach. So I don't know. I feel like we need to do some kind of like med circle doctor meet and greet at some point and do some of these things great. together. <laughs> or a dance off. We'll see how it goes. Right, Mandy. Um, I know that Kyle would love to be in the dance off too. So, hi, Kyle. <laughs> we really uh, get that together sometime. Like, do we, a, a we flash do. mob or something. Oh, that or would be so. Circle flash mob. Yeah. Mental health med circle flash mob, but just, you know, we celebrate. Right. Um, uh, well, I know Dr. Tuslin does not like camping, but I love camping. I love the outdoors. Uh, I hike every day I, if I can, even when it's. 20 below zero, uh, live in the Midwest. It can get brutal. I love to, I love art. I, I am not good at music, but I can paint and I can draw pretty well. I love to write. I love, uh, also love to hear my children's laugh or, um, just now that they're older, that they're teens, when they just come talk and tell me about their day or what's bothering them or what they're worried about or excited about. That's very thrilling to me. Uh, anything that makes me feel like a kid again. Um, I don't care if it's swinging at the playground um, or, you know, zip lining or coloring. It could, it could really be anything, but anything that um, I really enjoyed as a child or didn't feel I had enough time to experience as a child. Um, yeah, those are, those are pretty much it. I love those, Mandy. I'm a huge outdoor person too. And I used to hike a lot more um, when I lived closer to the mountains, but mm -hmm. now I go out for walks and runs, but it's not the same. I really enjoy hiking specifically. Um, I love that you mentioned zip lining. I love zip lining too. And anything that makes me feel like a child, I get that completely. Um, yeah. As you guys know, one of my uh, favorite hobbies is uh, uh, the flying trapeze the so that definitely makes me feel like a child. Um, <laughs> and, and it's like that fearless feeling, you know, even though as an adult, you're, you're much more fearful than you were when you were a child. When I look, when I watch my son who is almost 11 months, he is completely fearless. And I'm like, Oh man, I know I remember that feeling. And that's really, really cool. So thank you guys so much for sharing what you guys have prepared for your stage one or your step one of this exercise. And I just wanted to ask the second graphic to be put up because I wanted to remind people that as you're coming up with your, um, uh, activity ideas. And this one is a little bit oriented the other way. But if you try to turn it uh, to its right um, by 90 degrees, you're aiming for this uh, section, this yellow section of flow where uh, some of these activities that you're going to choose 
have a high challenge level, but you also have a high skill level. So that's something that gets you into that state of psychological flow where essentially you forget about time almost and you're just doing something for the enjoyment of it. Oh, thank you for correcting that right away. Yeah, so essentially aiming for some activities to include that will definitely be in this flow range um, within your beautiful day is, is really, really helpful. So the second step is to plan is to plan your beautiful day by trying to include the different elements from step one that you think can fit into one day. And this includes a plan from when you wake up in the morning on this day until when you sleep at night. And you also need to set a date for this beautiful day and make any necessary preparations. Like if some of your activities are going to involve people, invite them in advance, make sure they're available on that day. If, uh, make sure it's a day that you're not working and that you can step away from your computer and just have no distractions. So it's really important just to kind of plan out all of these little details and make sure that the day actually happens. So I just wanted to ask Dr. Taslim and also Mandy, as you guys are thinking about the plan, one of the things I always ask people is, do you see any barriers that could get into the way of you actually living out and executing this beautiful day plan? So maybe each of you can just speak quickly to one potential barrier that could come up that might interfere with you actually living out this beautiful day that you're planning and what you might do about it so that it doesn't actually get in the way of you being able to finish this beautiful day assignment. Mandy, do you want to go first? Do you want me to go first? <laughs> um, go ahead, Dr. Tesla. I'm doctors okay. first. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so I think for me, uh, my two-year-old, um, is both a contributor to the beautiful day and could prevent that beautiful day from happening. Um, and so I think figuring out a way for um, me to maybe have some space uh, so that I could do the baking or I could, you know, dance for a little bit without having to necessarily attend to him, but then also having him be a part of it. Uh, but yeah, maybe it's just some planning around when he's going to be there, how he's going to be there um, so that he's not the center of the day. Great. Thank you so much, Mandy. Um, okay. I think um, one thing that I know often derails and not in a bad way, um, but anything last minute that's needed from work. Um, mm -hmm. I have a tendency to like want to get way more done in a day than possible. And if a last minute request comes in, I just, I add it to the current workload, but if I take a step back, I think I can take off something of my workload that day to accommodate for the last minute priority that needs to be in uh, and just kind of push the workflow on a different project a little out. That can give me some anxiety because I worry that I'm not going to get it done, but it would also allow me to just focus on that urgent matter and better pace out the day and then it not interrupt the rest of the beautiful day. Awesome. Thank you guys both for sharing. And Dr. Tossum, I just want to reflect that I totally understand what you're talking about. My 11, almost 11 month old uh, is part of my every beautiful day, but also can derail things that I plan like at 10am, I'm going to do this and whoop, nope, that didn't happen. And it's already noon and I still haven't done that thing. Um, so I completely understand that and having to sort of plan ahead and making sure maybe there are people to help and all of those things. And then Mandy, I know firsthand about your extreme work ethic. You and I have worked together and had meetings on weekends, which I felt very <laughs> bad about requesting, but you have been so accommodating as I've been coming back into work again, full time from early parenthood and saying like, I'm sorry, but the only time I think I might be able to meet to talk about med circle stuff might be on this Saturday at like 3pm, which is later at your time, because I'm on Pacific time. And you're like, sure, I'll be available. And I just yeah. felt so bad about that. But thank you for always being so flexible. But obviously, as you mentioned, it could also get in the way of your beautiful day, even if you're passionate about your work. And so sometimes people have a lot of guilt coming up during this stage as they're thinking about planning this beautiful day, like, oh, my gosh, I want to make sure I include every everyone. Um, also, oh my gosh, what about all of these other responsibilities? I do care about these other responsibilities. What do I do about that? And I think both of you guys have mentioned things that I think a lot of people will understand and, and can relate to. And I think it's important to know that this is not like your one shot, you know, you can have you know, a beautiful day every month or a beautiful day every two weeks. So it doesn't all have to get done on one day. So also being realistic in your planning is very important in this step. Um, the third step um, is to visualize your beautiful day as you're leading up to it. So let's say you've planned your beautiful day for 
a week ahead, that's say that you're got seven days before your beautiful day. I would challenge you to visualize your beautiful day at least three times before you actually live it. Why? Because we know that the neurobiology of our brains is that when we visualize things with as much detail as possible, evoking our senses, your brain lights up in the same exact areas that it would when you're actually living out those pleasant activities. And so it's really important to do that visualization. It works and it's so powerful. There's tons of research, for example, that shows that elite athletes, when they're rehearsing their sport in their mind, it actually helps them to perform just as well as if they actually got to practice on the field or in the pool or whatever their sport is. So I want to challenge you to visualize your beautiful day, put it into your morning routine or make sure that it's part of your um, winding down bedtime routine, set aside just five minutes to try to visualize specific aspects of your beautiful day. What it's going to feel like when you do that activity that you've planned, you know, when you do that baking, when you plan to go to the beach, really spend time savoring those details in your mind before you get to your beautiful day. The fourth step is to actually living or doing your beautiful day. So again, you, you want to make sure that in step two, you've written down this plan, you know, actually put it down on a schedule, you know, 9am, wake up, 10am, do this, right all the way until you get to bed. So then when you get to your beautiful day, and remember you're setting a day ahead of time, you're going to just live that beautiful day, really enjoy the moment, all of that planning, you know, anticipating barriers, that's all going to pay off because it's going to help you to experience this day as mindfully as possible. And whenever you find that you're not being mindful and worrying about what's going to happen the next day, be gentle with yourself, just bring your thought process back. And just say, it's okay, we all we all wander, it's all right, let me just go come back and really recenter myself on this experience. The final stage is to reflect and savor your beautiful day. So what I want you guys to do after you live out this beautiful day is to spend some time journaling about your experiences and the feelings that you had. And this is really, really important because when we're feeling depressed, when we're feeling stressed, it's very, very easy to actually completely negate those positive experiences that we've had. And our mind plays selective memory tricks on us. So it'll say, no, I wasn't happy that day, or that didn't bring me any joy. That wasn't fun at all. So it's important that you actually write it down as close to real time as possible. So I always ask people to do this journaling activity within 24 hours of living their beautiful day and go back and experience those emotions and connect with how it makes them feel. And also perhaps reflect on what you might change for the next beautiful day plan that you have coming up. So the question that I want to ask Mandy and Dr. Toslim is what are some of the things that you guys recall feeling when you do some of the positive activities that you've discussed. So from past experience, we're kind of doing this as, as a recollection exercise right now for demonstration, you know, how does it make you feel when you do one of the activities that each of you mentioned, and you can pick whatever activity you guys like to reflect right now? Go ahead, Dr. Tesla. Yeah, I, I would say um, creativity, confidence and freedom are what I feel when I'm doing those um, activities that I would include in my beautiful day. Awesome. Create creativity, confidence and freedom. Those sound like amazing experiences. And I would say that when people are feeling depressed, it's really hard for them to feel those experiences and those emotions. And this just demonstrates the power of, you know, when you actually go through with some of these activities and, and being able to be on the other side and saying, wow, I was able to feel that again. A lot of times when people are depressed, they feel like they can't never feel those experiences again. So having those experiences will help them to say, wow, this actually works and encourage them to do other things that are proactive that can help with their mental health. Mandy, what about you? Um, peace, joy, and love. So oh. um, I, I think the, the feeling I seek the most often is peace, just to, mm. just to be kind of chill and relaxed and, and, oh. and content with things. I, I, I used to be all about joy and happy and then just realizing that that's not attainable all the time. Mm -hmm. But if I can be somewhat at peace, even, even in the disturbance of depression or anger or, 
you know, sadness, whatever's going on, if I can do something just to skew that scale a little bit and bring it to a more peaceful thing, then that allows more um, opportunity to feel that joy and to feel love or loved or like I want to give love. Uh, so that's th those are the feelings that I would derive from that. And um, I love the fact that you, I just want to point out that in my mind, I was like, oh, it can only be one day. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> and for like whenever and I was like oh yeah you could do that like once yeah. a month That's awesome and that have it, it whenever you like but yeah. I love the feelings that you shared Mandy and I would say that those feelings are so congruent with having loving kindness towards yourself mm -hmm. When and that's a very, very hard thing for people who are depressed to experience sometimes like they feel so guilty, they feel bad yeah. about themselves, they beat up on themselves. And that, of course, just makes their depression worse. Yeah. But being able to tap into experiences of peace and joy and love um, also allows them to have self compassion, which is such an important ingredient to depression yeah. recovery. So thank you yeah. both for sharing your experiences. Thank you, Dr. Judy. I remember on one of the workshops, you we did a, a loving kindness meditation and I started doing um, loving kindness lunch. So my lunch break oh, nice. before I eat, I would just sit and, and have like 10 minutes and just kind of go through the meditation. You can Google it. You can find it wherever it is on one of our workshops. Um, and one of the workshops that we are offering um, on medcircle.com right now, free till the end of the month, is the inner child workshop. And why I mention this is that um, I think getting in tune with your inner child can really give some insight into what can make you happy, what can pull you a little bit out of that depressive funk. Um, I, I, Dr. Judy can probably speak a, a minute to that as well. But I do think it's very beneficial. So if you haven't checked that one out yet, just go ahead, sign up, check it out for free. Um, and, and Kyle will also be reaching out too for a gift after that, after you do, if you'd like to hear more about that, please sign up, just enter your email. It will be sent to you. Uh, and we look forward to that. Dr. Judy, can you really quick before we, um, have to conclude here, share a little bit, maybe about how doing inner child work might give us some insight into what we might be depressed about and how to work through that. Oh, yeah, I love inner child work. So as a skills based therapist that was trained primarily in cognitive behavioral therapy and associated techniques, the first time I heard inner child, I'm like, Oh, what is this like, wahoo business. Um, but it is so powerful. And it is such a cool exercise, because it teaches you how to reparent yourself and also teaches you that your past negative experiences don't have to live with you for your entire life, you can change that narrative and you can empower that younger part of yourself that suffered through pain and even trauma at times to be able to become more resilient. And so inner child work not only gives you insight into perhaps the origin of some of your struggles now, but inner child work also gives you essentially a chance in the here and now now to change that narrative, to empower the child, to give that child what it needed, whether that was support, unconditional love, uh, someone that they could count on, you know, you can be that person for your, your inner child. So essentially, your adult child is going to be there for your inner child. And um, we can obviously talk a lot more about how those exercises are conducted, but you can find them in the Med Circle Library. And I've always enjoyed teaching inner child exercises to everyone, including the Med Circle community. I, I enjoyed that because for me, it um, I, I kind of responded the same way that you did when you first heard about it. Uh, but when I started doing that, it really just gave me insight into what my needs really were and then how to best meet them for myself instead of just always searching outside for answers, uh, which can be helpful to some extent. But um, yeah. But it's never ending sometimes. Uh, so, so thank you for sharing that. I do think we have one member question about the beautiful day activity, if we want to switch to that. Maybe. Okay, there we go. For those who have very demanding jobs with long hours, what advice do you have to plan a beautiful day while suffering with depression at work? Totally understand. And I think once the day gets started, it just feels like another to do that you have to pile on. So I don't suggest that you do this at the end of the day. I suggest that you wake up 20 minutes earlier one day to plan your beautiful day and count that as your morning routine or your morning mindfulness exercise. And it doesn't take a long time. As you saw, when we demonstrated just now, you can actually plan a beautiful day exercise probably with just 15 or 20 minutes, you can also plan it in chunks, right? So you can do step one, which is just brainstorming ideas about your beautiful day in 
one day uh, for 10 minutes, right? The next day, wake up 10 minutes earlier again and actually plan the details of that beautiful day. Set the date, uh, think about who you might want to include and maybe send out some invitations for them to be available, right? So you can do all of those things in chunks. And then of course the visualization piece that is going to be done um, every five to 10 minutes, uh, you know, at each time that you do it. So it doesn't have to be long at all when you're visualizing the lead up to your beautiful day. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, are there any brief closing final words that either of you can share with our audience tonight? Dr. Judy, do you want to go first? Oh, thanks. Yeah. Well, first of all, I think that First of all, you guys are all here. So congratulations for being here and for learning um, these techniques. And I really hope that you actually take the time to practice these techniques because listening to them is really only one piece of the puzzle, but actually doing is engaging all of your mind and body to really trying these techniques. And remember, it's okay if not all of them work for you, but please do try them because you will find your unique toolkit and even if only two or three techniques really work for you, then you've got the two or three. Just keep using them. You don't have to keep switching it up. I mean, for me, for example, physical exercise is always a great coping strategy. And it's one of my big go-tos. And it's okay that there's not a lot of variety because that's really an important part for me that really works. Yeah. Me too. Me as well. <laughs> um, and yeah, just kind of going off what Dr. Judy said, that the importance of savoring the moment. Um, I think so often when we're trying new things or we're trying to do things that we once enjoyed, we become focused on the outcome, which often is feeling better or feeling peace or feeling joy or happiness or excitement. But when we're too focused on the outcome, we lose the opportunity to really experience and be present in the moment. So your beautiful day may not pan out exactly the way you were anticipating. Your um, pleasurable activities and building those positive experiences may not play out the way you were expecting, but that doesn't mean it's bad. It doesn't mean it was wrong or a failure. It's really about allowing yourself to be there and to experience those moments and allowing life to take you on the journey that it's meant to take you on. Yeah, there's a, a phrase that goes, if nothing changes, nothing changes. And I love it because it's just a simple reminder that just, just one tiny little change or, or shift in perspective or um, little experiment that you can try sometimes is, is all the shift that you need to get that momentum moving forward. So I hope that this was helpful for you. Um, thank you both for, for coming tonight. And um, we are going to phase into our next two doctors, Dr. Lamb and Dr. Dr. Romani. So thank you, Dr. Tessa. And thank you, Dr. Judy. See you both very soon. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Our next section, we will be um, joined with Dr. Lamb and Dr. Romani, and they each will also be going through a technique to work through a low-grade depression in reference to productivity, but hopefully you can see how it can expand beyond that. So we will get started with Dr. Christy Lamb. Hi, Hello. Dr. Lamb. How are you? I'm great. Thanks. Great to see you. Thank you. You too. Um, and uh, I think we can bring uh, Dr. Romney on for a minute. Hi, Dr. Romney. Hi, how, how are you? you? It's great to it's see good you. Good to see you. Uh, so I'm going to have each of you first just speak a little bit to depression. Uh, you can discuss, you know, what what makes it low grade versus severe or whatever message that you want to give our audience tonight about depression. And then we will start with Dr. Lamb. We'll do your activity and Dr. Romani and I will participate in that. And then we will switch. Dr. Romney will do an activity and Dr. Lamb and I will participate. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, Dr. Romney, is there anything that you would like to share about depression? I think that depression, like so much of what we talk about in mental health, is on a continuum. And I think because tonight we're talking about sort of m maybe depression on the milder end of the spectrum. So folks who may still feel that they can go to work and engage in some of their responsibilities, there's a tendency for sometimes people to say, well, you know, this isn't the kind of I can't get out of bed. I'm not functioning as well. Maybe this doesn't qualify. And almost sort of being self-disparaging in the face of that. Like, I need to get it together. There can be more self-blame in that. So I think what we have to remember is this is on a continuum. 
Yes, at the milder level, certainly a person may not have the same level of social and occupational impairment, but that's not to say it's not painful. The sad mood, the fatigue, the negative thoughts, the negative feelings definitely take a toll on a person. And I think the key is that people don't sort of get into that pain competition that, oh, maybe this isn't enough to be an issue, but to understand like any, you know, any, any experience or a mental health issue that happens it, it it's on a on a continuum from mild to severe and that at the milder ends inclusive that these are issues that require people to seek out the help they need and to be kinder gentler and more self-compassionate with themselves the thank you dr romney the continuum seems to be a theme dr judy had had shared um a, a diagram with us that kind of basically said the same thing and that's extremely refreshing and comforting to hear that it that it is a continuum we all kind of can experience it it can fluctuate it can get worse but it also can get better so mm -hmm. thank you for that um dr lamb how about yourself yeah i think um the this continuum uh i think it it's really hits with um, uh, something that was posted, I think, on MedCircle from a, a video um, that I had done with you all regarding the same concept of the continuum of how important it is to acknowledge the low end of the continuum because it helps us see this acknowledgement of the spectrum helps us see that um, it can be better and it can be worse and that I can intervene at any one of these stages. It is so important to understand that this is part of the normal human kind of condition and that on the low end, we don't have to dismiss it. We can engage and often when we engage in the lower end, we can prevent bigger, more major depressive episodes from happening. And as importantly, we can see, okay, this isn't just something that comes out of nowhere like lightning, that I'm just genetically flawed in some way and there's nothing I can do about this. And so in the lower grade of depression, when we can get attuned to noticing it, um, acknowledging when some of the symptoms are coming in, we really have an opportunity then to intervene in a place where we aren't as depleted. So whether we're talking about anxiety or depression, low levels of anxiety, noticing little, little pops in anxiety and being able to regulate so that it doesn't just build or noticing little bits of lower energy, less engagement, detachment, or self-attack that's coming in. When we can see it in this lower end, we have the opportunity to intervene and really kind of cut it off at the past before it becomes something bigger. Um, so such important piece of this. I think it is a common theme that we've all been talking about, the sense of this being on a spectrum, it being part of the human condition. And the more that we can look at it, pay attention to it, and exactly what Dr. Romney said, that idea of so often when people have low grade, they dismiss it or even may attack themselves even more of like, okay, I'm not really depressed. I should just push through this that that's really kind of missing the point here, that those low grade symptoms are a signal flag that can let us know it's time to pay attention, it's time to intervene to take care of ourselves in this moment. And starting to get aware of when these symptoms are coming up so that we can intervene um, can make all the difference in regard to symptomatology and kind of the duration of symptoms. I really like the fact that it is moldable instead of fixed and that, that in and of itself just gives um, extra hope to to dealing with uh, depression, whether it's low grade or severe. So thank you both for that. Dr. Lamb, let's go ahead and dive right into your exercise. Can you please give the viewers a little bit of background of what this is and why it works and then go ahead and start? Absolutely. So um, I uh, loved the transition into inner child work that we were talking about um, <laughs> as we transitioned into this group. I think the first two exercises that were shown are such useful and helpful exercises that are very behavioral. And, you know, I come from a training background in psychodynamic psychotherapy, which really kind of looks at unconscious processes and looks at the emotional connection to our symptomatology. So coupling the behavioral activities that we talked about earlier, and then starting to look also at what might be driving the depression can be really helpful so that we can wrap our heads around what's going on. And rather than just treat symptoms, potentially get at what might be have, having what might have driven the mechanism, the engine of the depression to start with. So what I mean by that is that when we think psychodynamically about depression, depression in and of itself, we kind of um, put in the place of symptoms. So when we are depressed, we often think about 
the term that Dr. Judy is right, anhedonia, feeling just not feeling pleasure in things we used to feel pleasure in. Often this comes from being detached, um, isolating, um, avoiding in our lives. We often have a sense of fatigue, lack of motivation, lack of concentration. And in this space, we can start to self-attack, start to judge ourselves. We can feel helpless and hopeless. All the kind of symptoms of depression can come in um, and we can address those symptoms behaviorally. And that I think often is the first step that's really important and helpful to kind of get energy back in the system. Once we can think clearly about this, it's really important and helpful to then look back and see what was it that was driving this? And what was it that sparked this depressive episode? Now, certainly sometimes these things can come, um, can really feel like they come out of nowhere and we might not know the, the exact origin of it. But most commonly in the work that I do, patients come in thinking, yeah, this depression started three months ago, and they have never made a correlation to what was going on three months ago. And the more specific we get, the more we look at that time frame, what was going on, we can often see that there's something going on in their lives that brought up a ton of feelings. Um, I'm always talking about the triangle of conflict, which is this notion that if we have deep core feelings that get pushed down, if at some point in our lives we were told it's not okay to be sad, it's not okay to be angry, it's not okay to feel um, anything other than joy, if we push feelings down, the resultant um, uh, affect is anxiety. So what happens when we push a feeling down is we get anxious. If you try and hold back tears, our throat gets tight. We might get squirmy. Anxiety comes up in the body. And then we do things to try to not feel so anxious. And these we call defenses. And this is that triangle. So if once we've navigated the depressive uh, symptoms, we can then work back and start to see what is it that was driving this? What was going on? And that takes a curious look at what specifically was going on at this time that depressive symptoms were coming up. And can I start to look at what feelings were being repressed? So I have found in my practice, um, people who have seen my videos before know that I'm a big fan of anger, um, that very commonly anger gets repressed. We've been societally um, encouraged to not be angry. Um, it's gotten muddled with aggressive acts. So the feeling of anger has been somewhat demonized. We push anger down, we get anxious. And one of the most common things that we can do is turn it back on ourselves. And this is where depressive collapse can come in. I was working with a patient just today who we started to talk about anger towards her husband. And we noticed that she started to hold her breath. She started to get weepy and tearful and started to talk about how hopeless the situation was. I was asking her about the feelings toward her husband for an egregious act that he had done. And she could intellectually say that oh, it was upsetting, but immediately we could see this mechanism of self-attack, that it started to turn back on herself and she started to feel depressed in the session. She started to notice fatigue. She started to notice feeling hopeless, feeling helpless, and feeling like, um, you know, a more of a depressive uh, space. When we're talking about low-grade depression, often there is a closer connection to, you know, if, it, if it's kind of coming up um, in the moment rather than I've been feeling depressed for five years, these lower grade depressions that come in when we can notice a shift in when it started and start to take a look, we can start to explore the feelings that come up. And it really is the antidote in my um, practice to depression is feeling, is getting really clear about how you feel, even in really difficult situations, allowing the space for real grief differentiated from a dump into depression. Um, and so it's kind of like plumbing, um, which sounds a little bit crude, but the idea is that if feelings come up, if they aren't allowed to be in the direction that they belong, that blockage can make a pipe that gets turned back on ourselves and turns into depression. So feelings get um, transmutated into self-attack and depression and hopelessness and helplessness. So what we're going to do is take a look at um, any time that any of us has had an experience of feeling um, a low-grade depression, of when was the last time that some of the symptomatology came in so that we can then take a look at what the inner monologue is. Noticing the inner monologue can be very helpful so that we can identify, oh, I'm in that place. And then we can start to question um, and dismantle some of that inner monologue and see where these feelings actually belong. Okay. So um, if anybody wants to start, I can, I, I, I'm <laughs> ripe full of my own examples as well. So um, please feel free. If there's, if there was a time recently where you may have been in a place where you felt um, 
self-doubting, self-attacking, um, feeling somewhat depressed, withdrawn. Um, and if you're open to exploring what was going on at the time, we'll, we'll start to take a look at that. Dr. Romney, would you like to go first? Sure. I, I'm thinking of a time, probably the time I felt most like you're describing was the end, towards the end of August. So multiple things were happening for me. And I, I really, I felt constantly exhausted. I wondered why I'm doing what I'm doing. I felt helpless. I felt hopeless. I felt angry. I felt like a bad person. I felt like a bad mother. I, I, I just felt bad about everything. And it, I, I know what was happening at the time. I had two daughters being, getting ready to move out and all the emotion around that meant they were lashing out at me a lot. So I was having to sort of come up against their, you know, they're like, ah, you know, kind of coming at me. I was finishing a book. I, w I had a lot of other work to do. Um, and so everything had sort of reached ahead. There were a lot of logistics to deal with. And so I was just, it was too much for one person. And, um, and I was kind of burned out. I was burned out on caregiving. I was burned out on working. I was burned out on doing, you know, a lot of it on my own. I felt anger that I was having to do it on my own. Um, and uh, yeah, and so that I was really pretty wrung out at the end of August. Yeah, it sounds like it. And I mean, this is such a perfect example, right? Where as you're letting us know the symptomatology and letting us know when it came up, there was a very clear, st there yeah. were multiple stimuli that made the stress and anxiety higher at baseline. Mm -hmm. Things that, you know, you might have otherwise enjoyed, but a lot on your plate. And I mm -hmm. think that depression, we know, is much more likely to happen when our stress levels are really high. Yeah. When our anxiety is high, it's very easy for that dump. The brain goes on overload and we kind of dump down into a depressive collapse. But the thing that was most significant to me was the relationship with your daughters, mm -hmm. right? That people were moving out. There were mixed feelings that were coming up. And you mentioned saying, um, I think you said, I'm not a good mom, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, right? This self-attack was coming yeah. in. And so some of the questions that we can ask ourselves are, could that be a depressing thought? So just identifying when mm -hmm. I label something, could me attacking me, can I start to notice, could that be a depressing thought? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Could that thought be hurting you? Yep. Mm -hmm. And when we get clear when these thoughts started, the question that we can ask ourselves when we're getting clear about feelings is, where might that attack actually belong? Where might that aggression actually belong? And you mentioned you had some anger towards your daughters, mm -hmm. right? That you clearly are supportive, caregiving, you mm -hmm. love them. And it's really hard for us to hold mixed feelings. Yeah. And that often when we have feelings towards someone else, they get turned back on ourselves, especially mm -hmm. when we're in high levels of anxiety. And so one of the things that we can ask ourselves is where do these feelings belong? Mm -hmm. When I say that, it doesn't in any way, shape, or form mean that we're going to lash out at them or be mm -hmm. aggressive towards them. But can I just hold these daughters that I love mm -hmm. make me angry? Mm -hmm. And I wonder what it's like just to hold the mixed feeling. These daughters that I love were lashing out at me and were making mm -hmm. me angry. Mm -hmm. What do you notice inside when you say that or when you let that in? When I let that in is, you know, I feel like that's, that's, you know, it's, it's not, you're not supposed to do that. That's not right. There's a lot of social comparison for me. You know, I, I, I felt a lot of guilt. I was actually kind of looking forward to them both moving out and finally getting to sort of enjoy my empty nest. And everyone around me was like, oh, I'm so sad. My kids are leaving. Blah, blah, blah. And I was like, <laughs> you know, I'm thinking I am kind of, how much longer is it? And you know and what, it, and it, it was hard because I felt really guilty about that because I actually was thinking, okay, it's time for you to go. Yeah. And yet a lot of people around me, because a lot of people are going through that same developmental phase of people whose kids moving out were all really sad and isn't this awful. And what am I going to do with myself? I'm thinking, what am I going to do with myself? Like, where does this list begin? It was almost <laughs> a sense of otherness, you know, I was having. Right. And so that, you know, at one level, there was kind of like this defiance to it. But at the core of it was a sense of guilt, because it was, that doesn't feel good. And I, you know, I don't like feeling that. And, and what is even quadruply painful is it's actually I, my mood has improved significantly since they've been out of the house, you know, because there there's not anyone like, you know, yeah. and I was and I thought, and then there's these moments, I'm like, 
is that bad? But I feel so good. I feel so much healthier and I feel so much lighter and happier. And so I'm trying to lean into the emotion, but every so often the guilt wafts in and I'll often go into this place. Well, maybe you weren't meant to be a caregiver. Like I'll still go to a disparaging space of this very important role in my life of being a mother. I then devalue yeah. myself in it. And that will give me, that will definitely put me into more of a negative mood, but I have to acknowledge I'm taking better care of myself. I'm sleeping better. I'm eating better. I'm exercise. All the things I haven't done for many, many years, yeah. there's actually now time to do it. And so it, I knew it, things were going to get better for me after they left. And that drove a lot of guilt at that time too. Yeah. That it was, thank you so much for acknowledging the guilt piece, because I think that, um, you know, in ISTDP that I've trained in underneath the anger that we talk a lot mm -hmm. about is the sense of guilt over mm -hmm. having anger towards people we love. Mm -hmm. And then we punish ourselves for feeling anger towards someone that we love as if there is anyone on this planet that we don't have mixed feelings towards, mm -hmm. especially our children, right? Mm -hmm. We love them dearly. We want the best for them. And they suck the life out of us mm -hmm. at certain times, right? And that, um, and that they can abs. You know, I have a five-year-old who still can tantrum like you know her head is spinning. And the love that I have for her, and the rage that comes up inside when she's flipping out. And the more that we can allow the space for that, the more that we can allow it to be normal and okay to have mixed feelings. And you know, I, I so appreciate that sense of that societal. Everyone else says, oh, my kids are the best and I'm going to miss them. And I'm, there's no anger. I never have any negative feelings. It's all bliss and love. I don't think is always completely. I mean, if, if you're out there, like put it in the comments what you're taking that makes that happen. <laughs> because I've never met someone who opened up and really looked inside who couldn't say, yeah, there, of course, there are times that I get infuriated or that I question whether or not, um, you know, I, I want this. And mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that we don't want it. It means we also want space for ourselves. And yeah. so I, I can't thank you enough for looking at this with us so openly and about the notion that when I can allow myself to feel, to know that mm -hmm. I have love and anger concurrently and that they don't negate each other and I don't have to feel guilty about my anger, anxiety can come down and we don't have to go into that place of self-attack. The self-attack comes in almost as a way to try and protect others from our anger. But we don't have to protect people from our anger. Our anger is just a feeling inside that comes up and lets us know, gosh, there's part of this that's really frustrating and I want some space back. Beautiful. Just information from our bodies. It's normal. It's healthy. And being able to create the space for the reality of what is, what comes up, the mixed feelings we have towards everyone, even our children, um, is so healthy and actually preventive in regard to depression. Allowing more of our feelings to just have access to them, to normalize them, and know that we actually don't have control over the feelings that come up in us. We have control over what we do um, with those feelings, but we don't have control over the feeling that comes up. And sometimes we get angry and we don't even know why. And it's okay. It's okay to have guilt. It's okay to have love. It's okay to have grief. And that these feelings are more than okay. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Romani, I can't thank you enough for, for sharing such a perfect example, especially I think parent-child having anger towards our children is a really tough thing to, to acknowledge and to um, talk about and to allow ourselves to feel and so quickly can dump into that self-attack that can lead to depression. So I perfect, great example. Thank Dr. you. Ra Dr. Romney, as you, were, as you were saying it, my anxiety was going up because I know exactly that feeling of like, that just that tension between I am feeling this way, I shouldn't be feeling this way. Does it mean I don't, does it mean I don't want them? Does it mean this? Um, so Thank you all both for just being moms and understanding that. Uh, and, and Dr. Lamb, just for validating that we can have mixed feelings and that's okay. And that's actually mm -hmm. preferred and normal uh, to accept that. But, the, but they are very difficult to sit with. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. That we've been so socialized against it, right? But um, you know, if we just go to bi basic biology, before I can think I'm angry, my amygdala is firing. So before I have any conscious awareness of it, I, I have no control over the amygdala in my brain, the part, the uh, emotion center in my brain. When someone does something egregious to my child, my amygdala is going to fire before I can even know that I'm angry. And so the studies around this, the fMRI studies that show this brain activity and the 200 millisecond difference between our body's reflexive response for an emotion and our conscious awareness of it really kind of takes us off the hook for having feelings. 
we don't have control over them. They just come up. It's data. It's information. It's like a fever coming up. I don't have control if I get a temperature. I don't have control if I get hungry. Those sensations just come up inside of me and it's information. It helps me know, oh gosh, yeah, I do need some more space in this relationship. I felt kind of suffocated or like I've been giving too much. So when anger comes up, it lets us know I have a need. And so it's such a useful um, uh, you know, data point that we can start to hone in on, but only if it's normalized, only if it's allowed. And so many of us have been just taught that it's not allowed. You're not allowed to have mixed feelings towards people that you love. And so we push it down, we get anxious, and then we turn it back on ourselves. I, I think even um, mixed feelings on people that we love, relationships, or even our work, um, totally. you know, you could, you could absolutely love what you do, but there's still this toughness to that relationship of, of just being exhausted by it or feeling burnt out or um, just maybe someday not having motivation or creativity within you. Uh, it, it's good to know that, that there, there's that continuum again that we can flux back and forth. So thank you, Dr. Lamb. Absolutely. Absolutely. And Mandy, do, do you have, uh, I don't know if we have time for a, your example or should we? We can, we can move on um, if you want. And then I can share in the next, um, I don't know how many, how much do you have more to the exercise? No, this is, this is the exercise. This is being okay. able to take a look at what's been going on. What, what, what was the situation beforehand? And then starting to ask ourselves, right. Are these, could these be depressive thoughts? And okay. um, when these depressive thoughts come in, could these be hurting me, right? Yeah. When did they start and where does this actually belong? Yeah. Um, Bridget said we have time. Okay. <laughs> so we'll go ahead. Um, there's some things that happened recently, but I think it would be, I would like to, to maybe dive into something that happened in the past um, when there was, I could talk about a couple of different things, but more of a issue. I'd had a chronic illness kind of under the surface for a long time. Nobody could diagnose it. To diagnose it. it took forever to get a diagnosis. Then it was, you know, pill, you know, do take this pill, do this, do that. And the entire time I was in a ton of pain. I was 80 pounds overweight. I, I couldn't move. I was super depressed, very angry. I had to, my ex was um, a first responder. So he was on shift every third night. My mom would have to come over and take care of the kids. And, and this went on for a while. And it, and even though I'm naturally a positive person, it, it really ate away at um, any hope that I had that anything was ever going to change because everything we were trying just wasn't working. And I just felt myself slipping worse and worse and worse. So that did bring up a lot of anger. That did bring up a ton of frustration. As I look back on it, that had been building for a while, but it all seemed to just kind of snap one day um, for me, like when I had just, I had just had enough. Right. Um, yeah. And, and I did, I definitely attacked myself. Like, what is wrong with me? Why am I, why am I not healthy? Why can no one, no one figure this out? I must have done something to deserve this. Uh, all sorts of, all sorts of negative self-talk. No, I so appreciate those, those specifics on the self-talk, right? Because we can see so clearly how in the midst of a really difficult situation where there's going to be mixed feelings over the loss of function in your life, right? So potentially some real grief. And then also the anger, um, uh, the, you know, especially when we're talking about chronic pain and um, uh, so many of the um, uh, autoimmune disorders, um, the medical community at large can be incredibly dismissive. Um, some of the advice that is given or the medications that are given can actually make things worse. And so um, medical trauma is a huge issue in the midst of chronic pain and chronic illness that I don't th think gets talked about enough. And the amount of feelings that come up towards providers who are dismissive or family members who uh, it's just all in your head, all of the things that can come up right? If we aren't navigating the feelings that are coming up in this, in the midst of this really difficult situation, again, we can get anxious and then we can go to this really helpless, hopeless space. Um, gosh, that 
uh, I had so much empathy come up for you, that sense of like, what did I do wrong? Do I, that I deserve this in some way, right? We could, I mean, and I've had patients who almost had magical thinking around the idea that, you know, they brought these things on themselves for, you know, things from their past. We can really get into a place of self-attack when we don't allow ourselves to just metabolize the feelings that are coming up as they come up. And so allowing the space for grief, allowing the space for the anger that can come up in the midst of a medical workup, of having to go through painful treatments or misdiagnosis or again, treatments that cause more harm than, uh, than good can bring up so many feelings. And the more that we can allow those feelings to be, it doesn't change the situation, right? It, it would be lovely. You know, I think sometimes with anger with a specific target of someone who's done something, we can have a conversation. We can maybe change the situation. With chronic pain and chronic illness, we can feel kind of impotent in, in the midst of our anger. But we don't have to feel anxious and we don't have to go to a collapsed, depressed place if we can metabolize the feelings that are coming up as they come up. To be able to allow the feelings to come through, to be able to feel sad, to be able to feel the anger, to direct the anger where it belongs so that it's not getting turned back on ourselves. And this is um, something that I think is often very difficult for those of us. And I am in this camp of someone who can really go to town on myself when I'm feeling um, feelings towards other people, or if I, sometimes in the face of grief, I can really beat myself up to avoid those deeper feelings. But the more that we can practice noticing when we're in that space of self-attack, noticing that that means there are some feelings coming up that I'm avoiding. I am there. It is. I will say this as a definitive rule: self-attack, self-punishment is never useful. Um, we can at times get wedded to it, thinking that it makes us stronger or tougher or pushes us in some way, but self-attack is never going to be long-term uh, a useful um, mechanism that comes up inside of us. And so when we can see ourselves doing it, we have the opportunity to kind of work back on our triangle and figure out what is it that was driving this and what feelings are coming up that I need to process, that I need to allow myself to metabolize and feel so that I'm not channeling this back on myself, that if I can allow myself even to grieve about, again, the loss of functionality during chronic um, illness or chronic pain, I will actually feel better on the other side of that grief that isn't getting pushed down and turned into self-attack. Yeah, I eventually learned to do that um, by, you know, focusing more on what I could do instead of and instead of that. But I, I did. I defaulted to shaming myself, to that guilt that Dr. Romney was talking about, even even right. thinking I was crazy. Maybe I am crazy. Maybe the doctors, maybe maybe I am just depressed. Uh, yeah. There was there was a lot of that of second guessing. But I also noticed that that had been going on a, since a very long time from childhood, you know, just dealing with certain forms of abuse. You kind of just take that on that mindset on that, you know, that victim mentality of like, um, it's my fault. You know, I did this. I'm, sh I'm being punished. I'm doing that. Um, it, as much as I worked through that, I could I still get angry to this day. That's I still default to that. Whenever any stress comes up in my life, like immediately I can hear that you're not enough. You, you're never going to be able to handle that. You can't do this. And, and it takes a lot to to diffuse that and to work through it in a rational sense. And um, and I don't sit with mixed emotions very well. I don't know about I you, Dr. Romney. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, yeah, it's it's very tough, but I but I appreciate you, you know, breaking that down for us and, and how we can reflect on this isn't helpful at all to be thinking about this. And it's only perpetuating the depression. Absolutely. And I think that one thing we can, we have to watch out for, for those of us that are self-attackers, once we learn this, we can then attack ourselves for self-attacking. And you brought up such an important point that often we learned to do this protectively in childhood. Mm -hmm. So if I were, um, if I was verbally abused and told I wasn't enough, rather than have anger towards a parent where it was not safe to have anger, I internalize that and I say, I must not be enough. Then I can just shut down any feelings that I have and I can um, exist in this dysfunctional but relationship that I'm dependent on as a child. So we learn these mechanisms really protectively. I mean, it's incredible, right? That we would rather than fight against it and potentially put ourselves at real physical harm, potentially in a really you know, traumatic childhood experience, we learn to just integrate it, start telling ourselves this, colluding with the perpetrator to keep ourselves safe. So this thing that once kept us safe now has become generalized that I'm not allowed to have feelings towards other people. So I just turn them back on myself. And when we can see that mechanism in action 
as adults, we can start to say, okay, wait a second. That was protective then. This is horribly destructive to me now. I don't want to speak to myself this way. I don't want to, I don't want to be a perpetrator to myself the way that my parent or coach or whoever um, the perpetrator was, I don't want to internalize that and swallow them whole anymore. So acknowledging that and starting to notice this and being able to separate from it is so important. So I, I so appreciate that link to your past. Yeah. Um, th thank you very much for sharing that. Do, do you think that you know, after we kind of identify maybe back where it was and all these feelings that we're feeling and that I have identified that it's harmful to be believing or thinking these things, what, what, what would a next step be kind of out of that and learning to reframe or, or move forward in some way? Yeah. So I, I think that that identification piece is so important. Can I notice when I'm doing this to myself? Okay. So can I notice? And then for some people, it's really helpful when they've identified where, where the actual perpetration began, we can say, okay, so is, if it was your dad say it, do you want your dad in your head on a megaphone at all times? Is that, is that, does that sound good to you? And most people are like, good God, no, <laughs> I would <laughs> never invite him into my head. Right. I, I'm, if, if it was a traumatic experience, right? And so when we start to connect it to the destructive past, we can start to say, oh, yeah, thanks, dad. I'm good. I don't need to be, right? We can actually engage with the thoughts and decide that I am not going to treat myself that way. And then it really is so useful to then get clear what are the feelings that are coming up that are getting repressed, that are getting turned back on me? Because it's useful information. So if I have anger coming up towards someone, I need to know that because it means they're stepping on my boundary in some way. It means that I have a need that needs to be articulated, right? And that, um, you know, with Dr. Romney's uh, daughters, I, you know, she has lots of love for them. And they took up a lot of space and time. And so <laughs> she may need more space. It's a beautiful, and they may not be able to provide that for her or get it. But inside of her, that frustration gives her information that says, oh gosh, yeah, I have been on overload and giving and giving. Oh, I want to take care of myself. Beautiful. And she's now got the space to do that, right? Or, um, you know, if with a doctor in when you're getting a workup, um, if I notice the self-attack, I turn against it. I say, I'm not going to speak to myself the way I was spoken to. And I get clear about what I'm feeling. If I'm having anger towards a medical provider, that's useful information. They may be being very dismissive. They may be asking me to continue on a medication that's being more harmful than good. And when I can acknowledge I'm not okay with this, I can advocate for myself. So when we allow ourselves to deeply feel what we feel, we have the motivation and energy to move towards healthy action, that all of our emotions put us in towards healthy action. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Lamb, for kind of guiding us through those next steps. Uh, I know recently we had done a, a live workshop on anxiety and sleep, and we did walk through some similar activities about really identifying what was going on and, and allowing ourselves to feel that. That is one of the free workshops we are offering on our homepage now. If you just enter your email, sign up, you can watch it. There's some great tips in there. Uh, so again, thank you, Dr. Lamb, for sharing. And Dr. Romney, are you ready to walk us through your activity? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. So, you know, when one thing I find working, especially with clients who are in the more mildly low-grade depression, they are still getting up and going into life, right? They're engaging in their caregiving responsibilities. They're, uh, they're going to work. But what a lot of folks feel is that the absolute, there's a sort of, again, that the anhedonia that you said Dr. Ho had talked about, there's, a, there's an apathy, there's almost like a sense of walking in sort of, like you're watch, walking again half as fast, and you feel like you're not getting stuff done. And when people aren't getting stuff done, they often feel worse about themselves. Like I'm not productive, I'm not doing anything. And that can almost play, double down on some of that apathy. So there's a whole, there's a whole world of thought around behavioral therapies for depression. And a lot of them in the most simple form is like, let's get people out there doing things. And anticipating doing pleasurable things and developing a sense of what's called self-efficacy from feeling like they can do things, like can get something done. Because that's really kind of the bane of what many depressed folks go through is that I feel like I'm not getting anything done and I'm just looking at this to-do list getting longer and longer and longer. People freeze up more and more and more. 
So we think that what ends up happening too is for many people who are dealing with any level of depression is they'll often put very unrealistic expectations on themselves. Again, that they can't be realized. A person who's depressed does have lower energy and a sense of fatigue, so it's harder to get things done. So the one thing I encourage clients to do is I'm like, let's cut the day up into three chunks. You can cut them up in any three you want. Some people will have morning, afternoon, evening. Some people might say before I go to work, while I'm at work, and when I come home. It really comes down to how a person's life is sort of designed. So I'd say to everyone out there, whatever three meaningful ways to just go boom, 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 that these are sort of three distinct areas of my life. Ahead of doing this exercise, I'll often, and I'll say, try to do this when you have bandwidth. One thing that's important to do is in the next step is to determine what time of day do you feel like you might have, you might feel a little bit more mentally sharper or have a little more energy or whatever it may be. What are tasks that need to get done? What are other things on your to-do list? Whatever that may be. When you do have a little bit of that vim and vigor, a lot of us do have to-do lists and those can feel overwhelming, but it's a good idea to sort of keep those on a running list, often on a device or something where it's not a piece of paper you can lose and let that kind of accumulate. Again, typically when you're feeling at your best, for some folks that's morning, some folks it's afternoon, some it's evening, it depends. And then what I tell folks is you need only get one thing done in each chunk of the day, one manageable thing done. So, you know, some people will say, okay, I have to answer emails. So I'll say, okay, one hour of emails or whatever, half an hour of emails. And that will go into one of the chunks of the day. One, one of the things that a person may need to get done that day is maybe they have to, I don't know, read something, a report for work. Okay. That's one chunk of the day. I'll always suggest to folks who are living with depression or experiencing apathy or anhedonia in the morning, try and do something that's efficacy building, meaning it's, meaning it's something you know you can do and get done. So some people, it might be, I'm going to walk, I, ha I have to walk the dog or um, I have to pack some lunches or something, you know, you can do like, this is something you can do without thinking, but it's a thing getting done. People say, well, walking the dog doesn't count as something to do. Yeah, it does. You don't have an op option. Dogs got to get walked. Put those things in your day. And people say, so I'm only going to get three things done in a day. No. But at least you know you're going to get three things done in a day. So the one hour of emails gets done. The report gets written. Those might be two critical points in your day. But instead of saying, okay, this afternoon, I have to do the emails and I have to redo the reports and I have to look at the spreadsheet and then I have to email back my daughter's teacher and then, and then I have to get the groceries. And I'm like, slow down. Three things. If the groceries are that important, then maybe we move report to one of the chunks of the day, we put the groceries in the evening. And so what happens though, is some people will say, well, I got the emails done and I got a few hours here. And some people will report sort of an elevation in mood, like I got the hour of emails done. <laughs> and then they might say, Ooh, there's another thing on the list. Okay. For some people to get it going for some people, it won't, they'll say, okay, I'm a little tired. I need a moment. But at the end of the day, three things got done. I found that this has also even been useful for clients who are struggling with attention and concentration, which are often impaired in depression. So three chunks, three things, that's it. Invariably, people will get done with more than three things because more often than not, people who, who are living with depression, in fact, any of us will say, I have to get these 20 things done today. Then we don't want to start our day, but always start with something doable. Like, you know, you can get it done. I'm going to give you my own personal example. I go downstairs because I never do it because I'm always too tired. And I, I make sure the kitchen is clean. Mm -hmm. I go down and I clean the kitchen. Dishes done, counters wiped. Kitchen is clean. every single morning. That, I feed the cat and I feed the hummingbirds. One, two, three. And when those three things are done, it's as though now I have permission to begin my day and I feel a little less overwhelmed. But if I'd started the day with, I've just got to, I've got to get right to these really aversive emails, I might not get out of bed. But I'm like, I can do the kitchen. I got this. I can feed a cat. I could do some hummingbirds. I got this. And then even on my most low energy days, I can just go. And I oh, often when I'm working with clients who are depressed, I'm like, let's track this. And they'll say, Psh, I got five things done. I got six things done. Three is too little. I'm like, okay, you know, but let's stick with three. And then what people will say is the act of doing begets more doing. And then for a person who's depressed, it actually shifts their cognition to like, I'm, I actually do get some things done. And, um, but to give themselves permission after one of them gets done, take some rest. So that's, that's, it's, it's very much, it almost draws a little bit from behavioral activation therapies and things like that of just doing almost become their own form of healing. 
I, I really liked that, Dr. Romney, and the whole time. And maybe Dr. Lamb was doing it as well. And we can share out a little bit. But I was going through, you know, all the things I have to do in a typical day. And where can I chunk my day? And what what can I pick? Mm -hmm. it, it, can you offer us any insight on um, picking activities? Should should that just kind of be like an intuitive thing or something that is urgent or like you said, builds efficacy? Do you have any advice that could be useful? Well, you have stuff to do, right? Like, you know, for example, if you're employed, you might say, okay, every day the certain report has to be submitted. You know, that's every day that has to happen or every Friday. So there might be certain things the way your workplace is, is constructed. It might be like, I have to edit this. I have to get at least one video edited a day. That might be a good thing to put in chunk too, to make sure it gets done. Um, some people might say I'm mentally my very sharpest in the morning. Maybe that's when you'd want to do maybe the more cognitively demanding task, saving for the end of the day when people might say, I feel much more fatigued than something that's almost overlearned. I think it's a good idea for people who are, again, when they, when their bandwidth is strong, when they're actually feeling okay to almost sit down and maybe make a calendar every Monday, this has to happen Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, whatever it is. It might be, those are certain days in your caregiving responsibilities. Certain things need to happen. And, and listen, if on one of those days, let's say you have therapy every Wednesday and you have therapy on Wednesday afternoons, boom, that's junk too. done. I'm going to therapy. I went to therapy. I'm done. And so it, again, it's that sense of, I did the thing. I did the thing without it being, without it feeling unrealistic. And so and, and this could also be a useful task to work on with a therapist. And some people might even divide the task. Okay, I have a caregiving role. I have a, a work role. I have a, you know, household role, whatever those things might be, you might be also clear on some of those and, and those epic once a day, do something, you know, you can do like, just so that thing gets done. You're like, okay, I am getting things done. I am getting through my day. I liked that. Um, can that include like something, you know, you're going to do every, like I have to make my bed every day. Mm -hmm. That's great. Me. That could be your morning. Could be one of them. Okay. Mm -hmm. That could I be know. one of them because then I think for some people that becomes almost a benchmark beds yeah. made. I can keep yep. going. And then from bed being made, you might say, okay. And then I'm going to pull those clothes out of the dryer or yep. there's something else that will come from that. But I like the idea of benchmark tasks. Like I said, for me, it's always making sure the kitchen gets tidied yeah. in the morning because it's sort of in the middle of my house. So when that feels tidier, I'm like, even the rest of the house is a mess. I'm like, okay, that got done. Yeah. And so whatever that might be, how, how about you, Dr. Lamb? Are there any, what would you consider? No, I love everything that you're talking yeah, about. I'm, I'm nodding the whole time. <laughs> I think that um, the idea of, for me, I, I love this idea of getting clear whether or not you are someone who in the morning has a bunch yeah. of energy and to set your hardest thing there mm -hmm. versus for me, um, when I'm kind of slow going, having that sense of age efficacy, like I did something, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm a big make my bed in the morning and it is mm -hmm. a benchmark. Like when I haven't made the bed, I know that, mm -hmm. okay, I need to regroup and figure out what's going on, why I wasn't taking yep. care of my, it, it's a marker of me taking care because I like walking home and getting into a bed that's made. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so I know that I'm taking care of myself when I do that. When I think about the other task during the day, um, the idea of getting the ball rolling is a big one for me. And I hadn't really thought about it until you said it this way. I love it. The idea of, for me, I can bust out my work notes. It's a task that is every day. I have notes mm -hmm, I have to write. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. mundane. I it's I don't love it, but it's easy. Um, yeah. I've been engaged with my patients, so it's easy to write the mm -hmm. note. Um, and sometimes just getting that going before yeah. I sit down to work on um, a bigger project or a presentation or something like that. It gets my brain going, it gets me moving and I've got it out of the way. And then I'm like, okay, I, I can kind of mm -hmm. take on the rest of the day. Yep. So these benchmarks are, are I think just so mm -hmm. helpful. Yeah. I love it. How about you? Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that Dr. Lamb and the different kinds of tasks and recognizing that by keeping it to three, you're not overwhelming yourself because you say, I'm going to do my work notes and then I'm going to write a manuscript and then I'm going to do this. Woo. That'd be slow down. You know, it's three things. One, you know, there's one, two, three. If you get more things done, bravo. That's great. But I think for somebody who is dealing with low grade depression, even that one thing, it's just, Okay, that's done. And and it keeps this idea of this overwhelming sense of more and more and more that can overtake a person with depression, like, oh my gosh, nothing's getting done. There's 10 loads of laundry, whatever it may be, that you know, now maybe that one load gets done, but that's maybe two loads get done for the week. It's better than leaving those and now there's eight to do at the end of the week. So it, you're also chipping away. And like I said, doing it begets more doing it. How about I you, Mandy? How about you? 
Yeah. Um, I'm glad I'm not the only bed maker or kitchen cleaner <laughs> in the morning, but it just, it, um, when there's clutter or mess, it just reminds me of all the mm -hmm. other things that I have to do. So yeah. just a little bit of order and structure really helps. Um, I know for me, I, I, and I noticed this a long time ago when I was teaching. So when you're a teacher, you know, you have a very set schedule. I taught high school it was, you know, certain classes were certain periods. When I moved into admin, I had a lot more flexibility in my day. And why I bring that up is I was able to notice like my most creative hours were like 7.30 to 11.30, like clockwork in the morning, very creative. I, I learned not to open my email during that time if possible, mm. to disrupt that creativity. Uh, but having a chronic illness, I have to have movement every day. It mm -hmm. helps. It helps my pain go down. It helps, you know, just everything get moving. And I have the most energy for that in in the beginning part of the day. But then I feel like if I do that, then the creativity or, you know, mm -hmm. productivity goes to the wayside and, and vice versa. And um, I, I struggle with this. It, it feels like competing needs. And then mm -hmm. sometimes it's just, I just get frustrated and overwhelmed and not sure what to do. I've tried to, to give it some variety. But, but those are some things that have to get done, but, you know, getting dinner on the table for the kids, they're teenagers now. So sometimes thankfully they can cook, but just those things. And then, and then work stuff that I have to have complete, uh, those would probably be the bulk of what has to get done every day that I know I could muster to do. Uh, but even sometimes that's a struggle. So, but even what you just said, work things I need to do in working yeah. on this exercise, the key becomes pick one. Yeah. So it can't be as wide as if a client said to me, I've got work things. I'm like, pick one. And they're like, <laughs> okay, I need to make notes on this, you know, on this, on this five page document. Okay. So that's what you're, that's going to be your chunk two yeah. activity. And, and they'll say, oh, I think I could do more. I'm like, oh, that's fine for you. If you could do more, I'm saying, that's it. That's the yeah. thing we're putting on the table. Then they're going to keep going. But yeah. I think that when you say work things I need to do, you could see how a person who is living with depression would feel overwhelmed by that. So yeah. having something clear, make the bed, chunk one, read the five-page report and give my revisions, chunk two, put dinner on the table, chunk three. Anything more gets happen anything more happens, great. But each of those then become the thing for that time of day. And you can, you, people will really find that it's almost like it's a check mark. Oh, I got this thing done. Check. I got this one done. Check. I got, I got my three things done today. And then a person will feel like some people might say, okay, I'm going to double up. I'm going to try to get six done today that there might be a, that real idea of reinforcement. That's what the behavioral models are very much about. Oh, I feel good. I got those done. I'm doing something versus I've got this endless list of things. Otherwise we all feel defeated. And I think a lot of us do feel defeated by these long to do list. Now it's about making it manageable. And, um, and, and then I would also say to the degree you can come up for what feel, come up with what might feel like a, a real reward at the end of it. Is it a workout? Is it a walk? Is it a, is it a watching a certain TV show you love? Is it what it, is it reading your a book you love, but like something at the end of the day, that's sort of like, as you do it mindfully, you go in and say, I got my things done today and I'm going to enjoy what I'm doing rather than feeling like you're playing hooky and like, well, I'm watching TV. No, you got your things done today. Enjoy that. Yeah. What, what a great approach. And I like the fact that you chunked it, you know, three different parts of the day mm -hmm. because it's not like you do it in the morning. It feels great. And then you're just on a downward no. slope the rest mm -hmm. of the day mm -hmm. that we're getting these peaks throughout yeah. the day. Mm -hmm. we're, we're getting something done and then we're rewarding ourselves that that could feel a lot better. Mm -hmm. And I imagine just kind of help pull us out a little bit. Yeah. I do believe uh, we have one question ready. Mm -hmm. um, if we can get to that. I've lived the majority of my life with chronic moderate depression. Mm -hmm. I've been much better with medications for the past year. It feels too good to be true. I'm afraid it will come back. How can I adjust? Um, I'd like to hear from both of you. So uh, Dr. Lamb, go ahead and start, please. So I think that um, it's very, very common for people who have had chronic illness, uh, chronic mental health issues um, to really um, have anxiety over hope, to have anxiety over um, a, a sense that things are better and um, that they can trust that they are feeling better, that they can um, allow themselves to not get anxious and you know worry, perseverate, is it going to get worse? When's the shoe going to drop? And it makes sense because, again, I'm always going back to the triangle. Forgive me for my broken record around this triangle. There's real feelings about what you've been through about how painful it's been to have been in 
um, a chronic state of depression and that it can be scary to give ourselves permission to feel the relief, to feel the joy, um, because we think that maybe we can protect ourselves from um, future pain of disappointment of when we've had disappointment in the past around treatments that only worked for a little bit or didn't really make a huge difference. Um, and so I think there is something, you know, it sounds almost paradoxical, but actually not just let, it's a great example of not just letting in the painful feelings, but am I willing to also let myself really embrace and feel joy and hope and trust that um, if I am following a regimen that makes clear sense that this has made a difference, my medication, which has me engaging in my life more, which has me building more connections and sleeping better and all of the big pieces that play a role in our, our feeling better. When I can trust that there's a path to this, I can feel a little bit more confident that I can reinstitute this path should things dip. I think the other piece is acknowledging that they will dip. And people probably don't want to hear that, but hmm. on, for better or worse, life is not about always yeah. feeling great. And happiness is just not a persistent state. And so when we can feel comfortable to know, oh, no, there will be days when I feel crummy and there are going to be days when I feel low energy and low mood. And can I trust that the path that I have created with working with a psychiatrist to get the right meds and therapy and exercising and getting good sleep and eating well and all of the pieces that come together that I can pull on these when I need to in different ways when I have a worse day. So we can normalize the fact that relapses in symptoms will happen but it's not catastrophic because once you have had a sense that there are things that can get better and you know that there are things that you can do to intervene, we can pull on those things so that you can recreate that same situation again and again. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lamb. How about you, Dr. Romney? I mean, again, I want to echo what Dr. Lamb says. I think that, you know, one thing that's really important, especially with somebody who is, who is taking medications and ideally is, is, not only receiving medication, but is also in therapy, is to also work with your mental health practitioner because depression is cyclical. And so I think that it is that there is, it does, it, it, it will come and go. And that one thing that I know that um, clients who've had long term chronic depression will say is that there's actually some reassurance in knowing that I can feel the signs coming up when maybe another episode is coming along. So they're like, then I do, I, cons I, I, reconsult with my psychiatrist, make sure my meds are where they need to be. I talk with my psychologist, like in essence, it doesn't feel like it's something that's happening to you, but like anybody living with a chronic health condition, anyone will tell you they're dealing with an autoimmune condition. If they're dealing with any um, diabetes, chronic headaches, anything, they're like, okay, there's things I know I'm a chronic migraine sufferer. I know when one's about to come and I've worked with my physician on the strategy to use rather than, okay, here we go. I'm about to get, you know, steamrolled by one of these headaches again. Instead that a person starts to learn sort of some of their rhythms. And while it still will be uncomfortable of, okay, here we go. In some ways, then knowing that you can mount up a response with your treatment team, with your psychiatrist, with with your therapist, that in a way can also help you feel some sense of control, which I know is really important to anyone who's living with any chronic illness. Wonderful insight. Uh, very, very helpful. Thank you both. Um, Dr. Romney, you did a workshop for us on burnout and um, stress, and I am sure that is something that many, many viewers have uh, contended with, especially as of late in the past couple of years. So please check that out at medcircle.com. Um, we hope that you really like our workshop format. We really try and make them interactive and give you practical skills to work through some of these common continuums that we find ourselves in. Would either of you like to leave us with any final words? I, I would, I mean, listen, I, I'm, I'm going to always ask, say to people, if you can find it within yourself and it's hard to do when you're feeling depressed, if you can fall back on those principles of self-compassion, you know, the ideas of self-kindness and mindfulness and common humanity that, you know, I think that a lot of people talk about self-love and you're like, well, I don't, I, I'm not even going to go in there, but self-compassion is like, eh, I made a mistake. We make mistakes. It happens. Talk to, talk to yourself the way you talk to other people. You would never talk to someone else the way you talk to yourself. That's the case with 
with a lot of us. So when you think of it that way, say, what would I say to someone who's going through a hard time? Try to use some of that for yourself. And I think that, you know, I think that sometimes may not be enough when a person's experiencing depression. It, obviously, that's not a substitute. But in our day to day, if we could find ways to be gentler with ourselves, that can actually sort of help with some of those rough patches. And then no one to say, no one to quit. That on a day when you might have had a lot of difficult interactions, a lot of stress, there's a point in a day when you're like surrender whatever surrender looks like it might be taken it, it might mean the dishes don't get done it might mean that you go to bed early it, it might mean you know you just you spend two hours watching tv at night whatever surrender means give that give yourself that escape hatch because i think once we know we have that that's its own form of sort of self-kindness and say okay you know the, i i feel a little better now i took care of me whatever that looks like and then i can i can sort of get up and fight another day Oh, I loved that. Thank you. Dr. Lamb, anything else? Um, I think just reiterating that sense of the spectrum of, of these um, uh, processes and experiences that we have with depression and anxiety and acknowledging that the more that we can start to notice our inner monologue, start to notice our low grade symptoms, the more we can intervene and start to build the skill of intervening, allowing ourselves to feel, allowing ourselves to set ourselves up for success so that we can catch these symptoms early rather than our common habit of, you know, I'm fine or I should be fine and just trying to push through, really acknowledging, addressing, and facing these things head on so that we can use all of the great um, skills that we're taught uh, tonight and, um, and many others that, um, that people have shared um, on MedCircle in the past. Excellent. Thank you both for uh, your wisdom and expertise tonight as we kind of walk through this journey together. It was great to hear both of your stories, that you also are challenged by these things that we all are. It gives, you know, a, a universality to it that really can help us pull through uh, no matter what. So thank you, everybody, for uh, joining us tonight. We hope you found this helpful. There's many, many more workshops uh, available at medcircle.com please feel free to go to the homepage, sign up for a free workshop, try us out, see if you like us. If you're already a member, I know we have a bunch of members uh, on as well. Please feel free to email Carlin at support at medcircle.com. You can always ask for uh, certain topics to be covered or strategies or anything that you may be interested in. We are here to serve you and uh, we value your mental health and well-being. So thank you very much for joining us tonight. Have a great night.